But anyway, George, thank you so much for being here today with us. He's volunteered to do this part of this program, and uh, hopefully we'll have some good uh, memories to share with our friends. If you enjoyed today's program, you will be able to get this, I think, on YouTube. Right, George? Well, yes. The video is going to be YouTube, the picture I'll send them to you, and then you do whatever you want. Okay, all right, very good. Go ahead. Jordan Carleo Evangelis is a Director of Communications at the University of Albany. In that role, which is a huge role, when you look, how many students at the university? 17,000. 17,000. In that role, he oversees all institutional communications and media relations for one of the most diverse public research institutions in the nation. Before joining U Albany in 2016, he spent more than 12 years, and I remember this, as a reporter for the Times Union covering courts, government, politics, and the state capitol. He grew up in Nyack, New York, has a bachelor's degree in journalism from Boston University and a master's degree in communication from U Albany with a focus on political communication. He lives in Albany with his wife, son, and daughter, where he also serves on the board of the National Little League of Albany. Uh, George, we welcome you today. So glad you could join us like to hear a little bit about your job before you get into the topic that we're dealing with today, which I want to share a little anecdote. Is this a dangerous topic? A friend of mine last week was finally released from the hospital after 10 days for COVID and double pneumonia. If you remember the movie Misery with Kathy Bates, and James Kahn, where he was prisoner, she had to get medical transport to go home because of her breathing issues. She was more or less abducted by a QAnon person who, when she got in the car, the medical vehicle, was told, take off your mask, it's poisonous, it's all hoax, et cetera, et cetera. And Trump really won, and she took her all through the city, this is a true story, all around the city, spouting all these beliefs that she had. And Amy's sitting there sicker and weak, et cetera, et cetera, and not able to do anything. Take your mask off. It's poisonous. It's all a hoax to try to convince you. And on and on. She got home and her son said to her, Mom, what happened to you? Where, where? He couldn't drive her home because she had to have medical. And it, that's what happened. So it reminded me of Misery and Kathy Bates and... Uh, Take it from there. So it's it's around us in different ways. Jordan, you want to top that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on up here. Jordan is a delightful young man, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. That's very nice, and I can't actually top that at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm also not as young as I used to be, which is I've told all our folks at our table, I, I moved to Albany 19 years ago this week, and Azra was one of the first people I met when I moved here, because Azra, as anybody familiar with the Times Union knows, is sort of a newsroom institution, and I was 21 years old. I didn't know a single person in Albany, and Azra was one of the first people I got to meet, so it's great to see you here today. Um, thank you very much, Margaret. That was very nice. And uh, Margaret told me to walk around, but I don't think I can walk around and hold this microphone without falling. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you to the league for having me here and to all of you for coming out. I, it's interesting, when I first moved to Albany 19 years ago was when I really first was exposed to the league and its work. And I, I've always... I'm up, I'm up, I'm good. I'm, I'm, I've always admired it because it seemed like an organization that was sincerely invested in helping people better understand complex issues in their communities in ways that were civil and sort of small-d democratic and productive. And 
I, I think that the, you know, it's timely that we're talking about this because one of the reasons we're here today is because you can go out in the world or pick up your phone and scroll through Twitter and it feels like there aren't a lot of people doing that anymore. That there aren't a lot of people who are sincerely invested in helping people have productive conversations about complicated and sometimes contentious things. And so, you know, the league has always done that and I was never, uh, I should say, I was not at all surprised that the league was convening a conversation about misinformation uh, because it seems to me exactly the kind of thing that the league would do and exactly the kind of role that it plays in communities like, like Albany. I was a little surprised that I was asked to speak at it though <laughs> because I'm not, um, you know, strictly speaking an expert on misinformation. Um, you know, I, I'll talk a little bit about what I do do at the university now. Uh, I'm the Director of Communications, which, as Margaret noted, means I oversee pretty much all of the institutional communications, which just means uh, all the communicating with the, with the university itself and with external communities about our students, about our research, about our institution and what we do. That means media relations, it means government relations, technically speaking, um, not technically, I mean legally. I'm a lobbyist for the University of Albany, so I started my career there almost seven years ago in the Office of Government and Community Relations, and that's a fancy way of saying the university's lobbying office. Um, and my job was, and still to some degree is, to sort of tell a story about the University of Albany that's good. It's also true, um, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but it, it, with, the, with the stated goal of increasing support for the institution, we are um, a public institution. Uh, we get some, not enough, of our money from the state of New York. And, and one, one of my roles at the university since I've been there is to you know, tell the story of the institution and really our students in a way that encourages policymakers, legislators to uh, invest in the, in the SUNY system generally and in, in UAlbany specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to take the opportunity to stand here and not say some of the great things about who our students are, which is why I like doing what I do. Um, not many people know this about us, but 40% um, of UAlbany's undergraduates are black or Latino. So uh, those are demographics that are historically underrepresented in higher education. And uh, it's great that our student body is representative of what New York looks like. And many research institutions, that's not the case. But what's better is that our students who are underrepresented uh, are retained and graduate at rates that are the same as, or in some cases exceed, the student body as a whole. And that is very unusual. And so I have to put in just a plug for SUNY there, because UAlbany really is, um, it's not a hidden gem, it's huge. You can't drive down the road <laughs> without seeing it. Um, but there's so much good that happens there, and basically all of it originates with our students. But there's so much good that happens there, and I just encourage you all to take any opportunity you can to learn about us. Come visit us on campus, the Writers Institute, the Art Museum. They're all public, they're all free. Um, please come see us. So. That's what I do there, and like I said, I'm not, strictly speaking, an expert on misinformation. Uh, there are many experts on our faculty and elsewhere in you know, psychology, sociology, computer science, political science, who can speak with more authority about the social and cultural and technological reasons, and we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a lot about technological reasons, uh, why misinformation has become so pervasive and toxic in our society. It isn't new though, and so I'm going to talk a lot about social media because, as I hope will be clear, I think that is what has changed. People have always spread disinformation. There has always been misinformation, disinformation. That's not new. Human nature is not fundamentally different than it's ever been. But we have tools now that have dramatically changed the landscape of how we learn about our world and how we share information with each other. And to me, that is the biggest difference. So I do think that my background in journalism and communications have given me a useful perspective about how misinformation operates and how it takes hold. You know, as a reporter, I spent a lot of time trying to stop the spread of misinformation and participate in the spread of good, accurate information. And in my current job, I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, watching 
misinformation about the institution I represent spread, often on social media. But I think most important is that my experiences have forced me to think a lot about how and why people are vulnerable to misinformation and what we can do on an individual level to try to counteract it because it can seem at times completely overwhelming. Um, and by people, I don't mean other people. I don't mean people who are less educated or people who don't work in or with the media. I, I mean people like me and maybe especially people like me who like to think of ourselves as savvier than normal consumers of news and information. You know, the mere fact that you all are here in this room suggests that you probably are more voracious and more conscientious consumers of information and news than most people, but you're still vulnerable. And to illustrate why, I know we we're supposed to do this later, but I want to talk about one of my favorite bits of uh, recent misinformation. And I love this example because, in part, it's very stupid. And <laughs> seemingly inconsequential, which is actually often the case with misinformation. And that's part of what makes it really dangerous. Um, but I also like this example because, even though it's kind of stupid and inconsequential, it underscores so much about what I find scary about the ruthless efficiency with which social media spreads misinformation. Um, and so it's just one tweet, and I'm just going to read it to you verbatim. And I'm going to ask you in a minute if anybody's actually heard of this. But So here's a tweet. Quote, this is what happens when you don't recycle your pizza boxes. That's it. No capitalization, no punctuation, no context. 430 thousand retweets and three and a half million likes on Twitter, which is a huge, huge reach. And it's even, the spread, the reach of it was even greater than that, because that tweet was covered in the media, in the media, as if it were news. Does anybody know what it's about? No? Just anybody nodding? Anybody? What is it? Me? Yeah, go It's about Tate? Yes. Who was hiding out from basically the law. Romania, yep. Okay? Yep. And um, he had tweeted about um, the Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg right? Yeah. And oh, it was yeah. a nasty tweet, but so she tweeted back, and he tweeted back nastier ones. And, and so it, he sent a photo of him eating pizza, and the box was in Romanian, and it said where the pizza came from, like you know, it was delivered. And all of a sudden, his cover was blown. He, uh, the police knew exactly where he was. They went and arrested him right away. And so then Greta said, see, you should recycle those pizza boxes. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's, that's a beautiful... Can you repeat what she said? Yes, I will. So, so for those who couldn't hear, um, here is the not-so-short version of this stupid story. In late December, this guy named Andrew Tate, who I, I didn't really know who he was before then, he's sort of a former kickboxer, social media personality. He tried to pick an online fight with Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg, um, who's quite famous. And he did this by, you know, antagonizing her on Twitter with photos of his sort of gas-guzzling, high-performance, very expensive cars. And Tate, you know, he's built a whole brand on being provocative and misogynistic and actually a lot worse. He was banned by Twitter until Elon Musk let him come back. And he succeeded. He, he picked a fight with Greta Thunberg, and she replied quite crudely, um, <laughs> delighting her six million Twitter followers and triggering this sort of whole round of flattering news coverage of how she put Andrew Tate in his place. It's a very quintessential stupid social media story. But that's not the end of it. It gets dumber. Um, <laughs> He then, Tate, then responded with a very weird video um, in which someone off camera hands him some pizza boxes and he makes a joke about how he's not going to recycle them. Shortly after that, um, police in Romania arrested him on human trafficking charges that were related to an investigation that had apparently been going on for months and months. Not surprisingly, liberal-leaning social media rejoiced in Tate's downfall and the civil rights, a civil rights lawyer uh, and Harvard instructor sort of weighed in with a theory, 
which was exactly what you said, that the, he had essentially outed himself to the Romanian police because there was a brand name on the pizza box that was a very well-known and identifiable pizza chain in Romania. So, seizing on our, not to speak for everybody here, but seizing on our collective desire to sort of believe that Andrew Tate is a bigger dope than we had previously realized, she fires off, the Greta Thunberg fires off this tweet about the pizza boxes, and that not only sort of bounces around Twitter, but it gets covered as if it were news by major news outlets with very wide followings. And so for about a day, this narrative takes hold that Andrew Tate was arrested um, because he was taken down by sort of his own hubris, by this crusading teenage climate activist, and his pizza boxes. And if you're the kind of person like me, who's inclined to see the way the world that I do, that feels like a very sort of righteous form of justice. You know? <laughs> um, but it's not exactly true, actually. And, and because this narrative spread so widely and so fast, the police in Romania took the extraordinary step of publicly clarifying that, no, no, we've been doing this investigation for a year. We, we didn't find him based on his pizza boxes. Um, I mean, I think they felt like a little bit upset that they weren't getting the credit. Um, but, but, but long story short, you know, the story that kind of tickled liberal social media for a day was just, it was like a little bit of misinformation and then it was gone. And you know, that's one of the most dangerous things, I think, about so much of the misinformation on social media, is that our first reaction, our first tendency is often to say, like, well, okay, but like, who cares? What difference did it make? Um, it's not QAnon, right? And the simple answer, I think, is none at all. It was just sort of this low-calorie social media controversy that, you know, had a half-life of 12 hours or 6 hours or 3 hours. But I think that episode actually reveals a lot about our blind spots and why we're at risk of spreading misinformation even when we think that we know better. Um, and and I, I think as I thought about what to say when I was thinking about coming here, the main thing I kept coming back to is that misinformation is not a problem that other people have. It's a problem that we all have and that the most dangerous thing we can do is think that it isn't also our problem. Um, so this story of Andrew Tate having been undone by pizza bounced around my social networks because of the way I've built my social networks. You know, I believe in climate change and humans are causing it. Uh, the people I follow tend to believe the same, and many of them think very highly of Greta Thunberg. So, you know, this almost too good to be true and as it turns out, actually, too good to be true story of, of Greta taking down, you know, this internet troll with a couple of really funny Twitter jokes was just the sort of thing that the people I follow would want to believe. And for a second, I did believe it. And, and that, that sense of, of certainty, of sort of, like, moral righteousness and outrage that social media essentially mainlines into our brains, that, that's the trap, and that's when we let our guard down, and then that's when we run the risk of, of participating in this problem as well. And so I guess the question is, so why does that happen? And, you know, that, that vulnerability that I had when I first saw that tweet, you know, that started months and even years ago with decisions that I made about how I constructed my own very insular online world. Um, the internet, and this is true of all new technologies, and the internet is not new anymore, but, you know, the internet, you know, offered, and still does offer, such promise of unfettered and democratic communication. Anybody can talk to anyone about anything. How could that not be great, right? Um, but the reality is that most of us live in online echo chambers that we've more or less built in our own images. Um, I don't generally follow people on social media whose opinions make me angry. Like, well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> like you some Astros fans, I'll leave it at that. Um, but, and that's good for my mental health, right? There's a reason why we do that. Um, but it's also terrible for our sense of perspective and our understanding of the fullness of what other people around us may believe and why. And there is a ton of social science research on this going back decades and decades, and I am not 
an expert on social science. Although, when I when I did get my master's degree, I did focus on political communication, and that really and specifically media effects, with the way that the roles that the media play in impacting public opinion and the way we view the world. And the upshot is that humans, in a very human and natural thing to do, we tend to surround ourselves with people who are like us, uh, who think like we do, and who believe the same things we do. And we do that because it feels good, it's validating, um, it reassures us that the way we think and see the world must be okay and correct because other people think and see the world the same way. It's, uh, you've probably heard this term as a form of confirmation bias, which really just broadly describes how, as humans, we gravitate toward information and sources of information, and that sources of information is an important addition, um, that are more aligned with what we already believe to be true. Most of us don't go about our daily lives looking to be proved wrong. Um, and that long, long, long predates social media. That is not a new human trait. And in 2008, actually, uh, a journalist by the name of Bill Bishop wrote a book called The Big Sort. Has anybody heard, that? heard of that book? What is the name of it? It's called The Big Sort. Not to be confused with The Big Short, which is about <laughs> the financial <laughs> crisis. <laughs> yeah. So uh, The Big Sort is about how Americans are, or were, and still are, uh, geographically segregating ourselves based on, among other things, political beliefs. Yeah. And I, I actually didn't encounter this book until three years after it was published when uh, my wife and I happened to be in Hartford, Connecticut uh, to see Bill Clinton speak. He was on a speaking tour. And uh, this was during the first term of the Obama administration and you know, sort of the heyday of birtherism, which at the time was sort of a shocking you know, bit of disinformation, but now, again, it would almost seem quaint to the kind of things that, that we that are routine, that are to be encountered routinely you know, on a daily basis, especially on social media. So Bill Clinton was talking a lot about political polarization and how he believed this was harming America. And during his speech, he, he cited a statistic from Bill Bishop's book that it, it, it stuck with, few statistics have ever stuck with me like this one did uh, for a decade. I still think about it. Um, in 1976, in the presidential election, 20% of U.S. counties, so 20% of the counties in the United States, voted for either Jimmy Carter or Gerald Ford by 20 percentage points or more. So, in other words, one in five U.S. counties, the presidential election in 1976 was a blowout, wasn't close. Mm -hmm. By 2004, so not, not even 30 years later, and almost within my, my lifetime, by 2004, 48% of U.S. counties had voted for either George W. Bush or John Kerry by 20 percentage points or more. And so the number of counties in which the presidential election was not even close, which is sort of a proxy for how geographically and ideologically polarized we've become, more than doubled. And that totally floored me. And it's worth noting here that in 2004, that was the last presidential election we had that was effectively run in the pre-Facebook era and before social media as we know it today. So it probably, since you are all sort of more news savvy and, and probably civically engaged, uh, probably would not surprise you to learn that by some measures it's actually gotten a lot worse since then. Um, you know, we just went through one of the most polarized and sort of mis- and disinformation-plagued election cycles that our country probably has ever known. Uh, a political scientist named Larry Sabato, he kind of extended Bill Bishop's idea, where he, uh, Sabato that is, writes about what he calls super landslide counties, and those are counties in which one presidential candidate receives at least 80% of the vote. Think about that. 80% of the people in one county vote for one candidate, which means it's a mega blowout, not even remotely close. In 2004, According to his research, about 6% of counties in the United States fell into that category of super landslides. By the last election we had, it was 22%. So even in the time since Bishop published his book, we've continued to sort ourselves and functionally live around people who mostly think what we think, 
and vote the way we vote. And if you live in Albany, like I do, you sort of know what that what that's like. You know, you're driving down the street and you know, you see the one Trump sign, and you're like, what? what? You know? I mean, and it's, it, it's just human nature. We've, we've come to expect it. It's not, you know, we talk about American politics. We talk about American politics in terms of red and blue states and red and blue counties. We've accepted. We've just accepted that we will sort ourselves this way. Um, so what does this have to do with misinformation? And I think this is what it has to do with it. President Clinton's point in invoking Bishop's work was that while surrounding ourselves with people who think like us and think the way we do and vote the way we do feels good, it's very bad for the country. It, it degrades our ability to see the world through other people's eyes. It, it diminishes the sense of shared purpose that tends to make compromise possible. Um, and, it, and this is where it gets real gnarly. It pulls us toward these dangerous and destabilizing extremes while at the same time making those extremes feel less extreme because everyone around us thinks the same way that we do. It so happens that another side effect is that it reinforces these information bubbles that we built for ourselves that make it extremely difficult to differentiate good information from bad information because all of our friends agree. And the polarization that Bishop and others have described, that all happened before the rise of modern social media. It's only gotten worse since then. In 1996, if you wanted to live around people who were more like-minded, you had to probably physically up and move your family to another community. And that could be done, but it required some work, and it took decades for the sorting that Bishop documented in 2004. It took decades for that to happen. But now, so much of our lives are lived online, and so many of our day-to-day -day interactions are mediated by social media, that this self-sorting that we do, it happens instantaneously and frictionlessly. It's so easy to only expose yourself to people who agree with you. So about 70% of Americans use some form of social media, and about half get some of their news, at least some of their news, from it. And what that means is that our knowledge of the world is filtered through these applications that make it so easy to insulate ourselves from other opinions and build our information bubbles with just the thumb, a swipe of a thumb. You don't have to move to a new state or a new county anymore. You just unfollow, you block, and you create a bubble in which you'll only experience information that you agree with. And so we spend hours and hours a day, and it is hours, because if you have a smartphone, it will tell you every week how many hours you used it. It's horrible, I hate, I hate Sunday mornings. <laughs> Because I'm going to get some bad information. We, we, we spend hours and hours a day in sort of these bespoke affirmation and gratification loops that are designed to make us feel better and more confident about the things we already believe. I must be right because all my friends on Facebook agree with me, right? I mean, um, and that, that's, that's the result of decades and decades of fragmentation in the, in the media ecosystem. Um, it started with cable news and in the 80s, got worse in the 90s, and then when the advent of modern social media as we know it today came about, it was like kerosene on the fire. So now, now on a daily basis, most of us don't need to encounter information we don't agree with if we don't want to, and that's really, really, really bad for our country. And it's bad because most people who share misinformation they don't think that they're sharing misinformation. That's why it's so hard to convince them otherwise. You know, QAnon, vaccine skeptics, election deniers, all of those things are, to some extent, the product of these toxic information bubbles um, that we've created for ourselves. And social media has made building these bubbles not only just really frictionless, but extremely, extremely rewarding. So, and it's even worse than that. And um, they not only make it um, rewarding, and they not only enable sort of humans to indulge this temptation to self-sort and, and build these bubbles, they promote it, they actively promote it using algorithms that we don't, as users, 
totally understand. You know, we're talking about the computer programs that run these applications and decide what we see and what we don't see and how much of it and what to recommend to us. We don't necessarily understand those algorithms, but they're designed primarily to maximize the amount of time that we use Twitter, or we use Facebook, or use YouTube. And they have nothing to do with what is good for us, or what is good for society, or what is democratic, again, with a small d. Uh, it's, a, it's essentially just a business transaction in which our attention, my attention, your attention, is the commodity that is being bought and sold. And you know these platforms that traffic in our attention, they prioritize not what is accurate or informative, or productive for society, but what monetizes, or best monetizes, our attention for their financial gain. It's how they make money. Twitter is free, sort of now, <laughs> but they need to make money. They have a lot of employees, not as many as they used to, <laughs> and, they, and they, they do it by commodifying our attention. And that's not just Twitter that does it. So there's a, a fellow by the name of Max Fisher, He's a reporter for the New York Times, and he has this excellent new book out called The Chaos Machine. Uh, it, you could not come up with a better title. Uh, it's, it's about social media. It's about social media and the way it has functionally rewired the way our brains work. But in it, he explores a lot of the research behind what does capture our attention and, and how it sort of pokes those pleasure centers of our brain. And it's things that would probably not surprise you because we see them in, in offline life too. It's extremism, it's moral outrage, and things that affirm our sense of identity. We like things that make us think like our team is right and the other team is wrong. It's pervasive in our politics now, and social media applications are designed to exploit that. And that's exactly what we were witnessing in that Greta Thunberg, Andrew Tate, Pizza Gate. It was a team sport in which the truth of the information was sort of irrelevant. You know, if you if you think that Greta Thunberg is a hero and the fact that she kind of laid low this internet troll uh, based on something that wasn't actually true, it's a minor detail. It's sort of beside the point. And as Fisher notes in his book, humans have always had these tendencies. This is not new, but social media actively incites us to indulge them. And to do it in front of what he describes as the largest mobs that have ever been assembled, which dramatically raises the stakes, especially when it comes to misinformation, because there are almost no interim steps. You go from zero to a thousand in a second. And it's one of the things that's so so intimidating and, and dispiriting about social media. As someone who uses it a lot and who does see the value it can create, it's hard, I struggle sometimes with whether or not the downsides are too extreme uh, to justify it. And, you know, the worst case scenario is something like the January 6th insurrection, where people are actually radicalized and moved to violence based on misinformation and disinformation, much of it consumed online, on social media, in these information bubbles. Um, it's toxic and it's destructive and it's very easy to feel powerless to do anything about it. And I say that as a user, as a consumer, as someone who can't resist picking up my phone and looking at Twitter, but also <coughs> kind of hates it every time I do. <laughs> you know? Um, you know, you'll never be able to correct a psychologically pleasing untruth as fast as human nature will prompt other people to spread it. And being right, you know, I'm sorry to say, is sometimes really beside the point. It's not about who's right, it's about whose version of reality m most lends itself to discord and divisiveness, which is what those algorithms that run those networks are looking for. It's what they're selecting for. I, I really dislike uh, using <coughs> war analogies because you know nothing in life is actually as bad as war is, but I, I often do struggle to find a better one to describe what this feels like to me. Um, during World War I, um, machine guns made the costs of war far more horrific than society had ever experienced before. It was like a paradigm shift in the way humans fought each other. And they were sort of ruthlessly efficient weapons that, that changed war and how it was fought forever. 
and well, it sometimes feels like hyperbole to say this, but I do truly believe it. When it comes to misinformation, you know, Twitter, YouTube, the algorithms that run them, they are, in that scenario, the equivalent of a machine gun. And they're having the same effect on society's ability to distinguish, you know, satisfying lies from actual truth. And increasingly, and this is one of the more um, upsetting things about it, and something that Fisher explores in his book, increasingly, those applications are run by artificial intelligence that trains itself how to effectively exploit our attention. And regardless of whether it's true or divisive, and often because it is divisive. And I'm not here to tell you that artificial intelligence is bad. I think there's a lot of really, really incredible things that it can do and that it is good for. And by the way, that we're researching at the University of Albany. But, but this application of it is extremely scary uh, because there are no longer necessarily human engineers and software engineers who are tweaking the algorithms that decide what we see and what we don't see. They've become so big and so complicated that using machine learning, they correct themselves. Wow. And I mean, technologically, that's amazing. It's incredible. It's a huge leap forward. And there are applications of that technology that are extremely good, like training algorithms to identify signs of Alzheimer's in saliva samples years, years before anybody else would be able to test for it. But that same technology has this sort of insidious effect on the way we communicate with each other. So it's a kind of information warfare, and we haven't really figured out yet how to adapt to it. And it's reassuring, I think, to think that neighbors talking to neighbors in rooms like this, around tables, that we can counter rampant misinformation with those conversations. But realistically, we can't, not on the scale that social media perpetuates it. So if you have a friend or a loved one who's turned against COVID vaccines by watching hours and hours of, of YouTube videos about it, and you probably do, it's very unlikely they're going to be persuaded by simply, even gently, repeatedly, telling them that they're mistaken. Which sort of all begs the question, well, what do we do, right? Like, you know, we just throw up our hands and quit. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, well, here's, here's what I think. And I think that this is a way for all of us to feel like we have more agency in this process. I think if we want to feel anything less than totally overwhelmed by this torrent of bad misinformation, disinformation that's out there, you start by thinking smaller and looking first at ourselves and the choices we make and our own behaviors. Um, for me, this is just me, that means resolving less or to worry less about Fox News. You know, I don't watch Fox News. I haven't watched any cable news regularly since mid-2016. And it will not do me any good. It will not do society any good for me to worry about what Tucker Carlson is telling the people who watch his shows every night. No, I mean it. Like, like if, 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 if we view the, this, the misinformation and disinformation problem through that lens, you know, neither you or I can fix these broken incentives that exist in our for-profit media system and that have been intensified by social media you know, times a thousand. We can't fix that on a day-to-day -day basis. And if, and if the only solution is there, then all we're going to feel is frustration and, and a sense of hopelessness, and we shouldn't. What we can do, though, and I do think this is really important, is that we can resolve to think more critically about where we do get our information from. Uh, we can think about how the choices that we have made have helped shape our information bubbles and the networks from which we derive our understanding of the world. I'm not, uh, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you watch Dr. Carlson for a sense of balance and perspective. But, but I am suggesting, I mean, if you want to, it's fine, but I, I don't think it's going to help. Uh, what I, I am suggesting, though, that we practice interrogating the news and information that we do consume on a daily basis in small ways, even if, and maybe especially if, it's coming from sources that are widely believed to be trustworthy. It's still a useful exercise. And so what does that look like? It, it, again, just in my life, I love the New York Times. I think it's probably the best, most influential news organization in the history of Western civilization. They do incredible work. And what I know about the world, a lot of it is shaped by the New York Times. But it's not always right. 
you know? And, and even when they do get all the facts correct, the way the New York Times frames the news, and sort of by extension, my understanding of the world, is the product of many, many decisions that I don't necessarily see. I know this because I worked in the news business. And those decisions are not sinister, right? It's not even necessarily people attempting to influence you, but decisions have to be made when the news is covered. And those decisions, which most news consumers never see, influence the way the stories come out, and by extension, the way we view the world. It's incredibly powerful. Um, and it's why news organizations like the Times Union and the New York Times are important, because we do want some level of professionalism and some level base ethical standards applied to how those decisions are being made. Um, it's why not all information is created equal and not all news sources are created equal. But I thought about all this recently because I was reading this series of New York Times stories about uh, the war in Ukraine and Russia's sort of missteps there and what they say about the post-Soviet era and Vladimir Putin in particular. And it was like deeply reported and it was informative and I was like totally engrossing, totally engrossing. It's exactly what the New York Times does better than everybody else. But I finished them and I immediately sort of found myself thinking, well, how much of these stories were influenced by Western intelligence services, right? So New York Times reporters have to have sources of their information. And Russia, Russia's intelligence is probably not talking to the New York Times. So, so these, these incredible stories were most likely heavily influenced by Western intelligence, who no doubt had an interest in making Russia look weak and bumbling. Now, to be clear, I have no reason to believe that a single fact in any of those stories is not correct. And I do not believe that the New York Times would intentionally spread misinformation or disinformation on behalf of any intelligence service. That's not really the point. The, the point is that simply taking two minutes to think about that kind of stuff and where the information might have come from is a very, very healthy thing to do. Um, as we all sort of navigate this daily quest to not be part of the misinformation problem. And I think just those are the kinds of little questions you can ask yourself. They take 90 seconds, two minutes, uh, after you read a story or after you see a post on social media, especially if it's something that made you feel good <laughs> and, and you want to believe, ask those questions. Nine times out of 10, it's fine. But that one time, you might find that the answer makes you question whether or not it's true. And if in that little moment, in that one transaction, you can break the cycle, that's a win. And it's not a small one, right? Because most people don't do that. We're not trained to do it. Um, and, and doing it sort of just really grounds us in the reality that all the information we consume on a daily basis from all these different sources, it doesn't organically find its way to our eyeballs. All the information we consume is the product of hundreds and thousands of choices, most of which are invisible to us in that crucial moment when we're deciding whether we want to share an article on Facebook or, or retweet a funny meme. And those are choices made by journalists, they're choices made by us in shaping our networks, choices made by the people in our networks about what they share, choices made by the companies and the machines that run those networks to manipulate the choices we make, uh, to maximize our attention. And the simple fact of being aware that these choices are being made by and for us is extremely powerful. And if the answer is to any of those small daily interrogations we do with our, with our information make us uncomfortable, we have the power to change it. We can change our habits. We can not share the article. And that is our power in the situation. It's why I'm not a total pessimist and doomer on this. You know, we, we can't individually solve the macro level problems that cause this, but we can all take small steps to avoid contributing to it. And although they're small steps, they're not insignificant. Because one of the things about the way social media operates is you know, one article that you don't share you don't know how many downstream people downstream of you will then see it because you didn't share it. You know, it's like breaking the cycle with COVID. You know, don't go to the supermarket sick, and maybe ten other people don't end up sick. It's a similar mechanism. And so, while those are small steps that we can take, the consequences of those steps are not insignificant. And I, you know, I think the logical question here is why why do I even use social media anymore if I. <laughs> So, so kind of down on it, which which I am. 
Um, and I don't know the answer to it. I, it's very complicated. You know, a lot, there's a lot of smart people who write about social media in the same way that we write about other addictive substances, you know, some narcotics and alcohol, because there's research that shows that it activates the same parts of our brain. You know, the satisfaction we get from, from junk information activates the same parts of our brain that that other forms of addiction do. And so I, I wrestle daily with whether I think the value it creates is worth the cost that I know it exacts. But if I can pat myself on the back, I didn't share the pizza box tweet when I first saw it. <laughs> uh, now, was that because like I immediately sensed that it was bogus? I mean, that's... As I tell you the story today, that's what I'm going to tell you. Is I immediately, I immediately sensed it was bogus. I, was doing, I mean, more likely, I just got distracted because the other thing that social media does, the other thing that social media has done, and this is like a, this is a whole other program, Margaret. It has destroyed our attention spans, right? And 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 the problem with destroying our attention spans is that it, it destroys our ability to think critically for more than two and a half seconds at a time about whether this thing might be true or not. So I, I don't know if I thought it was true or not. I don't know if I just probably just got distracted. And and the reason I don't remember is that so many of those kind of crucial little moments where we have an opportunity to either kind of break the cycle a little bit or perpetuate it, they happen so, so fast. So fast. And it's almost unsatisfying because I at the end of the day, I'm talking here for 20 minutes, I've thought a lot about this. The, the, the rule, the rule is, the best rule of thumb, I guess, is you know, if something feels too good to be true, and it feels too you know, karmically perfect that Andrew Tate was taken down by his pizza boxes, it probably is not true. <laughs> and, and that's a good time you know, to put down your phone and you know, take a walk, or get a cup of coffee, or just do basically anything else. And that's it. That's all. I mean, that's really the only advice I, I have is take those small moments. Seems to be. Yeah. Jordan, thank you so much. That was fabulous. I really appreciate it. We have to permit people to take questions if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> Do the opposite. So the, yeah, the question was, um, why can't we use you know artificial intelligence and algorithms to undermine disinformation uh, in the same way that it perpetuates it? I'm not a computer scientist. I cannot answer that question in a technical way, but. The a key thing to remember is that what those algorithms are exploiting is human nature, and human. So they can, they could build a computer program that could do it, but the computer program cannot make humans want to share true information if it's boring. Right? And the truth, and the truth is almost certainly more complicated and boring than whatever sort of high calorie, psychologically pleasing falsehood we're being fed. Uh, sure article in the Times Union, which was true, that most people in this study found that, think that crime has gone up because of bail reform. But no place in the article did it say whether those thoughts were true or not true by giving the data on that. Also, sometimes they say mumps went up three percent of thirty percent in such a uh, school. So now, are there four people who have the mumps? And I think that reporters have should take the time to make sure information is accurate, whether you know people think it or not. I agree. No, no, it's not, it's not a question, but I agree, and I think it's a good point. And I do think that news outlets have gotten very good, or gotten better, um, ethically. It's in our DNA as reporters. We're taught in journalism school not to take sides, right? But within the last, especially within the last five to ten years, when some of the things that are being said, 
and that news organizations are being asked to report on are so obviously demonstrably, demonstrably false, news organizations have gotten better at calling that out. And that, you have to understand, that is a tremendous, like, DNA-level change in the U.S. media to do that. And they've gotten better, and it's not perfect. And you're right, there are times when there are stories that lack the necessary context to, um, for the reader, the consumer, to sort of adequately referee, okay, well, who's right here if we don't have the numbers? And that's, you know, that, a lot of that is a product of reporters are working on deadlines with the information available to them at the moment. But also, I think, it, we were talking about this at our table, sort of innumeracy in the population as a whole, myself included. I have two degrees in communications and zero degrees in statistics, right? right? And so you make a good point. We don't know, um, we don't understand a lot about probability and basic statistics, which would make a 3% increase in mumps cases. We have no way of knowing, is that a lot or a little? I have no idea. What's the denominator? You know, what, and, and, and there, there are additional pieces of information that are necessary in those stories. I think reporters and editors have gotten better about including them and have gotten better about calling out stuff that is demonstrably false. It's hard for an entire industry to change its, its core outlook quickly, but I think they have done a pretty good job in response to what's been happening nationally. Uh, uh, so, Christine Florence, and thank you so much. This is a great conversation, and we all should be having starting to do this conversation. When I hear those, when I see those viral stories, and I saw that too, I was following it, and I thought to myself, what's going on elsewhere that I'm being distracted from that's important as well? Because that happens a lot also. It seems to be either intentional or synchronicity that sort of those things seem to drop when there's something really big going on elsewhere that is way more important. The other piece with the Tate story is that we haven't watched how this fell, he fell apart which is unfortunate because he's a very bad man. And his whole persona is now like empty warehouses, sexual slavery, and abuse. And all we know now is about pizza boxes and this macho man and you don't like men and it's become like a whole polarized thing and it's really unfortunate. So, but I have a question about, you're as a, a former journalist and working as public relations and communications, because a piece of this is around free speech and regulating it. So if an algorithm is not a human being and is a computer, does it have free speech? Are we therefore like obliged to find ways to control where a machine is either no opinion moralistically, no opinion other than profit, and is profit a substitute for, uh, is, can we just say that profit should not be free speech and that we should regulate it? Because these are important conversations which get derailed around how do we address this issue? Not, and I should, that's a bad word. Free speech is important, it's constitutionally protected, and it's one of the things that makes this country great. But it seems to be usurped by the profit motive, and do computers, which just are about generating dollars, have a right to have protected speech, which all of us may have get less and less of because these machines are making decisions. And so I think it's a, it's part of the po problem that we need to talk about. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting. Oh. Thank you. Um, th yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question. And it starts with, again, among the things I'm not an expert in is constitutional law. So I mean, setting aside whether or not, you know, government regulation of the way algorithms operate is a violation of speech or not speech. That's an enormously complicated question. I think the more basic question is, could the government possibly regulate algorithms in a, in a way that was at all manageable? Like, I mean, I didn't even know what that would look like because they are so enormously, com I mean, we struggle to regulate alcohol sales, right? <laughs> Which is fairly binary, it's fairly straightforward. And then when, when you start incorporating <coughs> You know these enormously complex computer systems that you know are so advanced that they're able to sort of fine tune themselves. I don't even know how the government would begin regulating that. I mean, it, it's a it's a really fascinating question, and I think you know we we approach the answer to that question from what we're used to here in the United States and sort of what's enumerated in our constitution. But you know, the internet, Twitter is not 
is, is not a, a U.S. institution. It exists everywhere, with the exception of some countries where there isn't free access to those sites. But it's a, the answer legally is probably different in every country in the world. And, but the answer technologically may not be, because I would seriously question whether the government would have the ability to do that in any sort of uh, adequate way. It's a really interesting question. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> um, I can't let a uh, praise of the New York Times go by. Right? I didn't say it was perfect. Oh, the New York Times is a newspaper that has an agenda and has biases just like any other paper in it, and you can ask Hillary Clinton about that. Also, if you are intimately involved in something, it's almost inevitable that when you read a newspaper report about it, you will see all the things they got wrong, as I recently did with the New York Times. And I have a group of friends that we just go through the New York Times and look for all their biases and everything. But that's not my question. My question is this. I understand it's your point that we should be questioning our own perception of what we see, right? That, and, and what about my neighbor who doesn't have the same viewpoints that I do. I, I'm a trial lawyer, I trained in cross-examination. And I, if I sit and I say, I, I can reasonably talk to this person, and what? Watch your elbows. <laughs> I can say, I can talk to this person and understand what they're, what, where they're getting their opinions and how they feel. And it's inevitable that it's reduced to quacking the more you, you, you pursue it. And maybe your friend stops you from asking questions. But, so how to stop in your elbows. Yeah, well, you stop, you stop me from, uh, so how do, you, how do you handle that? I mean, it, I mean it, it's good. It's good that we question our own, you know, opinions and beliefs. And I do that all the time, because my knee-jerk reaction, like with that story, is, oh, that's good and then think about, well, where did it come from? But, I mean, half, half of the country almost <laughs> has the other opinion. How do we reach them and make them do this? I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't try. I'm not saying that at all. But I, I think that, you know, it, it, the COVID-19 pandemic actually is actually, it's a, such a useful thing for this conversation because it affected everybody. And almost all of us certainly have been in conversations with people who we know, who we like, who we work with, friends, neighbors, family members, who didn't quite view what should and should not happen the same way we did, right? And we were probably certain of our view of, of, of whether it was about masks or vaccines or social distancing, shutting down schools. And so we've all been in those interactions. And I'm not saying that you can't have those conversations, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't try. But I'm saying if we define success based on our ability to convince that person, we will mostly just fail and become totally, totally dispirited with the process. I think, I think just from a communications perspective and an advocacy perspective, which is sort of what I do on a daily basis, um, you try to, to show and not tell, right? So I don't, I don't want to sit down with someone and try and have a conversation with them about why I think that they're mistaken about vaccines and they should believe me. Because that conversation, in my experience, just my experience, is most likely not going to end with them being receptive to my opinion. It might force them to dig in more. But, passively, through your interactions, whether it's a neighbor or a family member, you can do and model behavior, it's the showing, that might be more likely to bring them around than trying necessarily to convince them. I don't know if that, if that makes sense or is helpful, but I... What, if you try to understand, but my thing is to try to understand where, why they feel this way and where they're getting that information. And when you, when you put them into a, well, if you believe this, then why do you think this? And then, then I think it's they start to see their own illogicness. But I, you know, I... Well, see, but that's interesting because you're a trial lawyer, right? Yeah. So you want to convince a jury. Yeah. <laughs> but how often are you convinced yeah. the defendant? <laughs> right. I usually represent it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really, it's a, 
That's an interesting question. Sure. Um, Bill was talking about and talking about checking your sources when you're reading an article, even from the New York Times or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> to to take that step back and say, well, where is this person getting the information from? And this brings me all the way back to um, high school. Um, graduated in the very early 70s. And our school system for a very long time had a class where all seniors had to take current issues, CI. You're going to CI today, you got your homework done for CI, it's current issues. And back in the day before all the social media, we did have Newsweek, Time, they had a slightly different perspective. Our local Hartford Current had a slightly different perspective, the Wall Street Journal. The New York Times. Um, these were articles we were assigned to read and then go to like the lecture hall if all the seniors had to go to the main auditorium and then we'd break out in discussion groups and we would go through just that. We'd go, well, where did this person get the information? This article in this paper is about the same thing. Where did they get the information? Is there any um, benefit? I mean, I thought it was a benefit to our classes, I mean, way back when, is, are any schools doing this type of thing? Critical thinking on news articles and where things are coming from and checking your sources. Yes, and I, and I think that's sort of, I'll come over here, because I, I think that's sort of where the solution long term is, is that like, we need, for the next generation, the sort of, the civic education needs to involve, or need, it has to be based on what we now know about what social media does to our ability to critically process information. Most of what is happening in schools, when I was in high school certainly, and even now, is from a prior generation of media and, and online life. And so the, the curricula do have to evolve with it. That's really challenging, it's really hard to do for a lot of reasons, but to fix it long term, you know, it isn't convincing uh, necessarily the people who are my age or or older of the wrongness of their views, it's training the next generation to be able to better navigate the whole online world that we live in, which is just totally consumed with disinformation. Last question, last comment. I'm Emily Gallagher, and I think I have a direct answer to the question from the trial lawyer in red. And that is an organization that is across the country. It's being um, promoted in, in Congress where people on two sides, we use the language reds and blues for the conservatives. You've got to keep it close to your mouth. Um, there's, there's a national organization called Braver Angels. You can find it at braverangels.org. And they promote communications between reds and blues, between people who think differently. Because to, um, to think that all people who think differently from us are at the radical extreme is a real piece of misinformation that a lot of um, liberal progressives have. And it doesn't help our country to dig into the divisiveness and promote separation and animosity. I think the hope for the country is to try to bridge the gap and understand with respect and compassion what other people think and to communicate with people who think differently. Now, a lot of us are in our bubble and perhaps we are a bubble here. And one way to learn about that is on this website and there's another new source I can share with you where they have workshops and forums and podcasts and uh, opportunities for skills development to hear how people um, speak on different sides of an issue. And they speak intelligently. And they're not the extremists that we hear so much about in the media. And there's a new source, so that organization is called BraverAngels.org. A vast amount of information you can find out uh, from a balanced point of view. And another news source is called Flipside, and you can find it at flipside.com. And on major, many of the major issues we all care about, and we know what side we're on, and we don't respect those on the other side, this uh, news source, it's flipside.com, presents the left, the right, the red and the blue point of view in a way that will help inform you 
Why do they think that way? How could they possibly? And it answers that question. I think our hope is to bridge the divide. Thank you so much. And the one thing I'll say actually just on the, for the trial lawyer, and, but also relevant to the free speech question, is that, is that the, answer, the answer may not actually be a free speech question, but right now, um, major news outlets are being sued by Dominion Voting Systems and Smartmatic, and they're desperate to get out of those billion dollar lawsuits. And the reason they're vulnerable is because the allegation made by the companies is that they were complicit in spreading demonstrably false information about the election in 2020. And, and so the answer may not come through a constitutional question, it may come through a civil action. And, and, and right now, social media companies are largely protected under the law for being held accountable about the information that is shared on their networks. But that may be the avenue for, through which it gets addressed. It may not be a government solution, it might be uh, something that happens in the civil courts. Jordan, great job. Thank you so much. Thank you.